Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom? Go boom. Ging gang gong to do gong to la garaga. My name is Eric. I'm here uh, with Michael for the the uh, okay. Go to the chorus. Go to the chorus. Yeah, excision and the loved ones. Those are the two. Those are the yeah, two we're doing. That's what we're doing. Beautiful, beautiful fucking movies. I don't know uh, really what the tie-in with the two things is, other than you said they would be good and they were really good. <laughs> That's really enough for me. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Or... You know, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna chalk it up to blood, ladies, and obsession. That's okay. <laughs> That's every week of yeah, double feature. I was feature. gonna say. I mean, we can pretty much chalk it up to that every week. I want to let people know that this week on the show we have chapters so that they can skip over uh, what I'm about to say. But also, there's going to be spoilers, so you should probably skip the movies you haven't seen. But the, the fucking thing that has put me in such a good mood is that I don't have to ask people to go to our Kickstarter page. Yeah, this is... That's pretty good. Although we've, what, come out with, I guess, two shows since the Kickstarter has performed, uh, this is the first time that we are in a world... In a world where your Kickstarter has been successful. Right, right. Your inner world voice is getting pretty good, by the way. Thank I you. I wanted yeah. to compliment you after, on that. After uh, Don LaFontaine died, I ate his heart, and <laughs> now I have his powers. Oh, I'm so glad this show gets to keep going. <laughs> How could the internet be without? We get to keep going. We made it. It happened. Can you believe that? I know. Still no, no is the real answer. Still right? no. <laughs> yeah. Every phase of the, the way. So we got funded. And then uh, I was worried that between the time when we got funded and when the funding drive ended, people would unsubscribe, unpledge. So that <laughs> that freaked me out. And then um, I'm freaked out now because people's credit cards aren't working. Every step of the way, I'm going to be freaked out until the next step. I guess there's really only one more step. But thank you. I cannot thank people enough for they paid for our thing. I mean, that's, that's I know amazing. it's ridiculous. And we're going to reward them not only with this week's show, but also next week's the following what three weeks and then an entire year to follow that. God, I can't believe that. We're out of movies though, which is the problem. We didn't plan. <laughs> yeah, right. We didn't plan on having to come up with more movies. At what point was it a reality to you that we would do another year of the show? What time is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ask me again when we hit year six. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't really prepared to write a schedule. I guess that's the thing we have to do now. Yeah. And uh, we kind of fucked ourselves because now it's going to take even more time than usual. Yeah. I think that was the opposite of the plan. Well, whatever. But uh, but no, it's great. I'm really glad we got funded. I'm glad everything's working out. Now we just got to put all the things in uh, in motion. It'll probably take us a few weeks to get our fucking act together and mm -hmm. figure out what this is going to look like. But uh, it's great, and I'm really excited about it. So thanks again to yeah. everybody who who did that. Um, I want to talk about it more, but another week. There's a lot to talk about already with uh, film type things going oh, on. Oh yeah, the show. double feature. It's a show a podcast, nonetheless, that talks about uh, films. Spoils films using chapters. That's not true. We spoil uh, <laughs> our listeners with our chapters. So let's start with excision. Uh, by writer director Richard Bates Jr. Yeah, who, is that where you uh, start with Excision? I I mean I don't know anything else about Richard Bates Jr. and okay. I'm really glad he made Excision. So I just felt the need to yeah. say, hey, look, writer directors doing good things. So Excision for me was, um, you know how uh, you you now, but also me as well uh, as as horror people. I don't know if you've ever done this, but sometimes you do that thing where you go, I need to see new horror and horror movies are all bad. Right. <laughs> so you Google something like 10 best horror movies you didn't yeah, see totally. or uh -huh. 10 best new horror films. And uh, without fail, the list comes up and it's nine movies you've seen that you thought were terrible mm -hmm. and one that you've never heard of. Yep. Excision was the one I'd never heard of. Yeah, I was going to ask you um, where the fuck you found this, because you have this magical talent to find these things that I don't have. 
and furthermore, that I can't ask other people. And I didn't know if that's just, you know, you and I have seen so many of the same movies, uh, even prior to the show, but for the show now, that maybe our tastes have just lined up so well, or I don't know what's going on, but yeah. you find these, this was just a, a random internet search that yeah, brought I mean, you to I, this? I, re- I don't remember. I think I read about it. Uh, I, I saw the DVD at this weird comic book slash DVD rental place that's near right. my apartment. There's no such thing as a DVD rental anymore. It's all L.A. Tan slash DVD right, rental. Right, exactly. So um, that's the name of a Chicago uh, yeah. business, not a California <laughs> business, strangely. Um, and I remember doing that thing where you text it to yourself and then you go, what is this? And you delete it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, But then I think it popped up on a list. James Gunn might have posted about it. Someone oh, somewhere that, yep. told me again, and it was that thing where two points cross and suddenly it's a thing you need to see. Right. All honestly, all I knew about it was that it had something to do with periods. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, Modern horror film has something to do with periods. So immediately, and I don't think that that this is going to be the last comparison we get, but I had these visions of of a film that was going to be like May. Yeah, I got a little bit of that vibe. But maybe a little bit more sexually driven. Mm-hmm. Uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, May was pretty sexually driven, or at least how I yeah, remember exactly. It. That's what I mean. And 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 this movie had its weird sexual moments. Um, I mean, it had the whole virginity where she and the period thing, right? But that was kind. That wasn't the focus. Well, also the way the movie starts, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. But I don't. So so I say that that wasn't really the focus because I'm about to ask you a very difficult question. <laughs> Great. What's the focus? What is the focus of excision? All right. So we have our central female protagonist. Right. Words that just flow so naturally out of my mouth when we talk about it's central female protagonist when uh-huh. we talk about uh, horror movies on double feature. And we're dealing with her inability to fit in. Mm-hmm. her trouble in her family unit right and uh this obsession that she yeah. has so i guess if i had to point to anything i would say excision play on incision uh, obsession with um surgery mm-hmm. uh that's probably the the area i go yeah it's it's weird because i want to say that this film is almost static in its mm-hmm. characters you get all these characters you're thrown into this world where these characters have been interacting for, you know, 18 years or whatever, however old she is. Right, right. And none of the characters are surprised by pretty much anything anyone does until the sure. end of the film. Right. You're coming into their world. And granted, obviously things are it, it's showing things come to a head. Mm-hmm. Things are getting more and more tense at home. But these are things that if we were to be building the universe with the film. Right. I don't know if I would be able to suspend my disbelief enough to believe this character can function in a in a family unit. Yeah, it seems uh, that their interactions are pretty, you know, if you just came across this person, it's really abrasive. But to grow up right. around them, uh, it seems natural to these people. Yeah. Almost unfazed. Yeah, and, and the other thing that I thought was a very bold move with the film is we kind of get a glimpse into this family where they have the perfect little girl, but she's sick. Mm -hmm. And then they have a perfectly healthy older daughter who is also sick. Right. And you're kind of getting this idea that wouldn't it be nice if one of them was all the sick and the other one was all the great. (laughs) Is that an idea you're getting? Terrible person, Michael Kessler. I think that's what the parents are thinking. Yeah. Right. Is, is they, they don't wish either daughter was dead but they wish that all the bad was in one daughter yeah sure Uh, because it'd be easier to dislike that that character Mm -hmm. but that's the thing that's interesting to me is this character should be entirely unlikable because she's a horrible weird version of a human that instead of being unlikable somehow has this backwards anti-heroic charisma yeah that you end up rooting for yeah, when you say unlikable, that my gut instinct is to go is to stand up for her. Right. Like when you see uh when you see people go up against her in the film to feel as if 
uh, she's your friend and that you don't want bad things to happen. You're rooting for her. Mm -hmm. Not even in an anti-hero sense, but just in a, I don't know, we were all young and fucking awkward sense. Right. You know, there's the, the first jump rope scene. Yeah. I feel genuinely bad for her. Yeah. She has this, uh, she does this thing, and this is how I feel in my social interactions too, where I want to pat myself on the back anytime I have a conversation with a stranger, walk away, and it wasn't the most awkward fucking thing I've ever done. Yeah. In my head, I go, you know, it's like achievement unlocked, successful social interaction. <laughs> yeah. You know what? No one realized I was fucking crazy for the last five minutes. This is great. And she does that with the girl who's jumping rope. She says hi, she introduces herself, makes small talk, it's not weird, they look each other in the eyes, and the girl jumping rope is kind of just uh, dickish to her. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, that it makes me feel like, wow, what a fucking jerk. And look, you even pulled off the, the social interaction and no one's rewarding you for it. Yeah. Those moments happen a lot, and I don't know where that identifying with the character... I mean, there's, there's simple stuff like trying to talk to another person. Or talking to her sister. You can watch that and you can go, I identify with this human being. Mm -hmm. But then you see her have these explicit fucked up kind of dreams. Yeah. Do you identify with her there or do you go, okay, this is a monster? I think, you know, for me, those dreams are so interesting because they're twofold for me. You get this, this, um, horrendously violent and obscene scenario um let's just go for the throat and go for that abortion thing yeah so you get that really fucking bizarre abortion scene juxtaposed against this character looking gorgeous like out of some tarsum sing movie sure and so if this is her dream you are forced to grapple with the idea that this is something in an ideal world for her right because mm -hmm. she looks that way and in an ideal universe, of course, you look like, well, obviously you look like Tarsum Singh is directing your life. <laughs> right. Um, so. But she wants to look, you know, pretty and perfect. And right. The, she wants to look a societal standard of perfect. Sure. But at the same time in these dreams, she's not doing things that society would even mm. accept, let alone glamorize. <laughs> let alone watch in a film. <laughs> sure. Well, sure. <laughs> but I mean, there's this strange dual thing happening maybe it's the fact that she can perform actions that are comfortable for her that she you know has interest in and at the same time look glamorous to normal people well i think what it is is that the character is almost sociopathic in her lack of desire to fit in right she is comfortable outside of a social norm mm -hmm. and i don't think she cares that what she's into is weird Sure. I think she has a bent respect for authority that isn't broken. And I think that is the only thing keeping her in check because I don't think she gives a shit what people think about her, her peers. She doesn't care about. Right. Take a perfect example is the way she approached having sex with that guy. Right. She goes up to him, tells him, hey, I would like to have sex with you. Here is my phone number. And then she intentionally sets him up to go down on her while she's on her period. Right. He gets upset with that. He freaks out and she just kind of walks away like, whatever, I'm, I'm fine with you. Yeah. You know, I don't care if you don't like me. I've gotten what I need from you. It's not as part of a, a trap or a ruse of any kind. It's just that's what she wanted. And yeah. she didn't care about the social repercussions of that. Exactly. And so maybe in these dreams, the ideal world is that she's able to carry that out in a perfectly social norm. Yeah, sure. Which is just, honestly, man, the dreams for me going through this film, they jar me so much. Sure. Uh, the film's pacing is so, it's tame and, and the kind of drama is almost akin to something like American Beauty. Right. Where it's deep and it's rooted, but it doesn't. I don't cringe. I just go, man, sure. family life can suck. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, this abortion happens and <laughs> right. suddenly I'm just so taken aback thinking, okay, well, when this movie plays out, there's no way that it's going to get to that point, right? Sure, <laughs> sure. 
let's stick on the dream sequences for a second. But I'm also still not done with figuring out what the hell Pauline. So yeah. we'll come back to that too. Maybe if we kind of uh, explore these other areas, we'll have a bit more of an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. But it starts you out with these dream sequences, and they're they're uh, repo the genetic opera type of weird from you know the begin the treatment of blood against a comical blue grid background yeah it's kind of it's invoking a hospital theme but it's mm -hmm. in a very theatrical sense i mean when you mentioned the tarsum singh uh kind of style you're not saying you know glamorous and pretty like mean girls you're saying <laughs> like that dark artsy shit we just saw on the show the other week yeah, you know right and so the movie starts in probably as an abrasive place as any with this, what I guess is bleeding, chaotic slaughter next to orgasm. Yeah. I can only imagine. I mean, my head's spinning when right. that scene's going on. I don't know what the fuck is happening. Yeah. But using the context clues the rest of the movie provides, I think I can go back, having only seen it one time, and go, that's probably what was going on there. Sure. But climbing over the half-headed, yeah. severed, awkward body thing in the tub of blood over, <laughs> over the new body. Oh, the whole, these, the style and the mood of these sequences, and every time she wakes up from them, and she has a smile, and I don't know, I, I always wonder when we're talking about these, and I had the same problem back when we talked about Hostel that I get all excited over what the movie's doing, and that by getting excited, I look like a sociopath. Yeah. But- after five long years, I'm over that. I get excited for her. I'm very yeah, happy for sure. her. She wakes up from the, the dream, and as a rational person, I look at it and go, yeah, that was pretty fucked up. Oh, but she's smiling. Good for her. Yeah. Because she had a pleasant dream. I hope she has a good day. Well, and if you want to take that and do kind of a backwards extrapolatory experiment. Always. If you take the actor that's playing Pauline, mm -hmm. Annalyn McCord is her name. Yeah. The roles that she has accepted in, in television. <laughs> Are you familiar? She's on the new uh, 90210. Isn't right. She? She's like the sexy vixen in 90210. Yeah. And she was, the, she was uh, one of the really hot sexual characters in Nip Tuck. <laughs> sure. So anybody walking into this film with any sort of um, background in those shows, which honestly I had none, but sure. you know, homework being homework. Right. You're walking into this seeing Anna Lynn McCord, the hot blonde bombshell. Mm -hmm. And so when she's waking up from a wet dream, you're immediately going, but she's hot. So was that hot? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, again, back to our classic Hostel 2 uh, problem. You know, I'm probably thinking of a lot of Hostel 2 because of Roger Bart. Yeah. Who plays uh, Bob in yeah. this movie. So let me explain to you. You've delivered this movie to, to me on a silver platter here to enjoy during my weekend. Mm -hmm. It's as if I'm going to a place and I'm wondering if I'm going to have a good time. And then I walk in and I see my friend Roger mm -hmm. Bart there. You know, <laughs> it's just added bonus. Like, oh, well, Roger Bart's here. This place, first of all, I like Roger oh, yeah. Bart. We'll have a, a fine time catching up. And also uh, he came to this place. So maybe, you know, maybe he knows what he's, uh, he's doing. Sure. But it's one after another in this movie. John Waters is a fucking priest again. Yep. I mean, you have to be, and Tracy Lords from Crybaby, mm -hmm. you have to be fucking kidding me. I yeah. could not believe. He was just, he was just in town, uh, like last week. He was at the music box. But then also Malcolm McDowell, just yeah. God damn it! I just can't believe what is some of these equations here don't seem to be completed. Just fucking right. Uh, Joey Lucas. Sorry, not Joey. It, Joey Lucas is the name of the character from the West Wing. But the, um, the actor's name is Marlene Matlin, who is, I mean, you won't get far into her biography before finding out she's deaf. That is kind of a claim oh, of fame sure. she has. Yeah. Um, I hate just making it such a simple thing, but she has played probably the last... Uh, 20 notable deaf roles yeah. you've seen in I was going to say let's not let's not try to walk the PC <laughs> sure. line here if you sure. can if you can be the actor who is the deaf girl the deaf girl and i mean great and i mean everything. fuck off that's fantastic yeah if, right if you can walk into a room and go did you see that movie uh right wasn't the deaf girl really good in that oh yeah, yeah that's the deaf sure. girl from this from movie seinfeld from hell yeah. yeah that's great good for her God, especially just such a power player in the West Wing. Just such a great, great role in that. 
uh, just scene after scene with these actors. The fucking principal is uh, Ray Wise from yeah. Twin Peaks. And Swamp Thing. Yeah, it just made me so fucking excited this uh, this whole time. It really says something about these horror movies when they're bringing in these players that are veterans. Yeah, from other genres too. Sure. Well, it just, you and I are the type of people that don't really watch a film based on the trailer Mm -hmm. when i go to the theater to see a film and they have the one sheet sitting up on the wall right you know some people will go up to the one sheet and they'll look at it and go man will smith looks badass in that movie (laughs) sure that looks pretty good i'm gonna go see it i walk up to it and look down at the block print yep (laughs) and go "Mm, m night Shyamalan. no thank you yeah You've got it. I mean, I feel like the block print is somebody outlining the actual statistics of the film going. It's produced by the guy that produced that movie you didn't like. It's directed by that one guy you don't like. It's starring those people that are sometimes good when they're handled by these people who are not involved. Right. It's written by the guy who wrote that train wreck. Well, also, you and I have seen more than 10 theatrical one sheets and therefore realize there are only 10 different styles of theatrical one sheets. Right. Um, I'll link off on the site. I am creating so much additional homework for myself this week, but I'll link on the site. There's a, a really good page of just, hey, here's five different types of movie posters. You know, guy with his back to you, destroyed city. Yep. Uh, people on white, you know, mm-hmm. hugging with red font or whatever. I, they're great. All right. So back to Pauline, because this is really, this is the the central core of what I want to try and understand if we can get anything out of this conversation i want to know what the fuck is going on with her and why we like her so much right (laughs) so a few things about this character one a teenager Mm -hmm. in high school greasy awkward bad posture these are things that the the film makes a point of highlighting so they want us to know these things Mm -hmm. they talk about her fucking posture in here also the fact we're contrasting her constantly to her dream state and showing how gorgeous she is, right. and the actor's known for being gorgeous, we know that something, uh, you know, socially awkward teenagers, part of that is, yeah, I mean, your skin or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's also maybe you don't know how to carry yourself or interact with other people. You have stringy hair in front of your face. Right. There's a mixture of hormone and don't understand social normalcy right. during teenage years that, you know, make them really awkward. And so we know the character doesn't have to be like that. And we see this fantasy world she has for herself. So I think those are things we can relate to. Yeah. And maybe that has something to do. Everybody can go, maybe maybe not to this degree, but everybody can go, yeah, I had awkward teenage years. Mm-hmm. She also has a disconnect from her parents. Now, you hit on that a little bit in saying maybe they want the perfect daughter. They have between their two daughters a feeling like... You know, if only one daughter could live forever yeah. and be this, you know, this great little angel. Do they resent her for that? What do you, where do you think that disconnect comes from? I think it's probably both of them butting heads against each other because I think their parents are probably a little upset that Pauline is this perfect, able bodied girl who's, to their understanding, throwing her life away. Right. Meanwhile, her daughter, who could be the perfect, you know, human being is going to be cheated out of a full life right and i think that kind of extra attention to the younger sister is probably grating on pauline and she's you know feeling unattended to and unloved and plus she's not her mother's daughter yeah she doesn't want to go to the i don't remember what the hell they were calling it but um ice cream social yeah she doesn't want to go to the ice cream social (laughs) right and I, I mean, that that I think is probably the most natural and normal aspect of the film is having an outsider for a daughter and not knowing how to connect with them on a level that they're not just going to scoff at. Right. Um, There's also, you know, in being a psychopath, she might represent an extreme end of things that people have uh, maybe only played with remotely in their mind. Something like her obsession with surgery. Yeah. Everybody in a very broad sense has had obsessions, 
But also that obsession with surgery shows how uncomfortable she is in her own skin. Mm -hmm. And it shows, I think about the scene where she's marking up her body and thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to perform, you know, such and such operation on myself. I think anybody who's ever looked at their sel- themselves from anywhere, you know, in the range of bad hair day to cannot stand what you look like has thought about, oh, what if I got plastic surgery? What if I look this way? What if I had a different whatever? And so the place where she has an obsession is just the extreme end of something that everybody's thought about to right. some degree. Well, and I think it reflects on her. It's her one motion to make good with her entire family. Mm -hmm. If she can save the younger daughter's life, she suddenly becomes the greater daughter. Yeah, right. And I think that that's just a tantalizing fantasy as well, to be able to to take the expectations that your parents have kind of cast aside for you and go, too bad you didn't believe in me because I just saved our family. Yeah, she does seem really excited to show, show her mom. Uh, the attention to detail in her work and the smart plan with which she, uh, <laughs> God, this final scene, it's so simple and so safe prior to this that once we get there, it does start to feel like the inside or the martyrs mm-hmm. level of uh, brutality. And I think a lot of that is just because it's, I mean, at least for me, really unexpected. Was this unexpected for you? Did you... St- see where this was come what was your reaction first time you it saw was the this? kind of thing where as it was happening i was kind of going well yeah i, I knew this was going to be the outcome here and i sure and we I know figured, where it's going i figured this is what's going to happen and it wasn't until her mother walked in and the camera goes so she did that that i was like wait <laughs> right. why what is wrong with you you just sure. killed your sister and the neighbor right and you shaved your what is what the hell is your <laughs> fucking problem so it took it took seeing the reaction of, of another yeah, normal human being. Right. I was so to go, oh wait a second, this is not okay. I was so involved with Pauline and her her process because you're sitting there going, Well, of course, it's a film. She's gonna, you know, she's gonna work the surgery and of course I mean, you know, she's studied, so her sister will be fine. Aha. Uh-huh. I feel like I've caught you in my theory of relatability. Yeah. You're sitting there going, uh-huh, totally no. Well, of course you you chloroform the neighbor and take out uh, her organs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, another person is here. Yeah, I meant wrong. This is totally wrong. <laughs> Hi, other normal person. Look at this totally wrong thing happening. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about this movie for another 20 minutes, but let's talk about the loved ones. Oh, let's talk about the loved ones. Should we just lay out the crazy thing right away? Yeah, I think that I think if if we drop it later, it's going to derail everything else. So holy fuck, the secret yeah. is what I want to talk about. <laughs> um, I think it's Sean Bryan. Let's pronounce it Sean Bryan. That sounds good. Okay. Who directed this movie, who we've seen on the show before. Yeah. With Rebecca Watson when we covered the movie The Secret. Yeah. So can you do- give Okay, uh, hold on. It's a documentary. <laughs> no. It's a movie <laughs> called The Secret. The word documentary, it would be by Richard Dawkins and it would be about how crazy Rhonda fucking Brian is. What was the secret for people who weren't around for that show? Uh the secret is this idea that you can tell the sky that you want an elephant and eventually you will get an elephant. Right. The se- and basically it's uh what what's the what's their uh pseudo scientific term for it um i don't know quantum something positive blah, it's like blah. it's positive basically <laughs> positive thinking is what it is it's there's a there's a name for it but you uh you put out to the universe these good vibes that you want a new car right and the universe is forced to by physical law to <laughs> reciprocate right with positive vibes back in your direction which will only be able to manifest themselves in either a new car or a series of events where you get a new car or you die and nobody knows you wanted a car and the secret still wins. Yeah. So as Rebecca Watson pointed out back on that episode, that is total bullshit. But we also talk a little bit about why it's, it's beyond not true. It's kind of fucking evil, even though it sounds like, Oh, positive thinking is rewarding. That's sure. fine. It's kind of fucking evil. Yeah. So we talked about The Secret and we totally debunked it and we tore the movie apart and uh, very, very happy about what we did on that show. And then this movie, The Loved Ones, comes out 
we had no idea that it was the same director, mm -hmm. one of the many directors sure. uh, involved with The Secret. And I don't know, you know, in my head, I just like to think, oh, he was obviously trying to repay his debt to society. That's why he, yeah. he made The Loved Ones. Right. And this isn't really a problem for us. I mean, we just talked about Argento, right? Yeah. Hollywood is littered with people who think yeah. animals can talk to you psychically and right. that magic herbs do fucking whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. we come across this all the time. Yeah. Well, it, it, it would be – we would be insane to think that everybody that makes a movie that we like is an atheist humanist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, right. can't, we can't sit down – and just expect that every filmmaker we love shares our worldviews because honestly, they wouldn't make movies as good as they do. Right. Because they would make movies as good as your and my movies. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Although you can guarantee that the atheist humanist filmmakers will find their movies on That's double true. feature. That's definitely true. It's not Still it... waiting for our paycheck from Ricky Gervais. We'll see. <laughs> That's going to come through. Uh, so we have The Loved Ones, which is a film ostensibly not by an atheist humanist, but who knows? Well, so this is what I wanted to, and I don't have the information, so I like putting it out uh, to the Double universe. Feature Land. Yeah, right. And seeing if, uh, Double Feature Show at gmail.com, if we can get any answers. But Rhonda Bryan wrote The Secret based off the movie she created, she wrote, called The Secret, which Sean Bryan uh, co-directed or directed amongst, I think it's a couple directors. Uh, I don't know how many, but um, I don't know if Sean Bryan is, I mean, same last name, might not be related. Could be her son, because Rhonda Bryan is fucking 70 years old or something. Uh, could be husband. I know Rhonda Bryan is divorced. I'm pretty, mm -hmm. pretty sure she's divorced. So, I mean, I don't know, ex-husband, son, Never met her before in his life. Brother. I don't know who this guy is. I do know he made a fucking killer uh, movie called The Loved Ones, which yeah. was his you know, real debut as a solo director. And I also think it's kind of funny that we like to Trojan horse skepticism on the show, and then filmmakers Trojan horse woo into the show where we Trojan horse skepticism because their movie was good. Well, but did you, so when you told me that this, this guy was involved with the secret, did you suddenly start drawing the like hilarious parallels? I wanted to, but I, I was so focused on how awesome the movie was that I couldn't mine it for nonsense. Well, uh, that's not what I mean. But what I mean is if you take something like the secret, so we've already kind of discussed what it is and how it should be a wonderful exercise in positive thinking, but it's terrible. Right. Now imagine you have a person who lives in a world <laughs> where her father will get her anything she wants. And she says she wants to go to the dance with this boy. Mm -hmm. And so she puts that out to the universe. <laughs> sure. And uh, she gets what she asks for. You know what I like a lot better is thinking about, uh, you know, just in complete ironic amazement how this is a naturalistic horror film. Oh, yeah. How what we always see in horror films is supernatural nonsense killer from people who maybe, you know, believe in it and maybe don't. At mm -hmm. least some on the show that definitely don't. And now we have this guy who is involved in one of the, I mean, really small number of films we've ever done that's just complete and total bullshit. And he's the guy who's bringing us part of uh, what you were talking about last week as our recent wave of naturalistic horror. Yeah. You think there's kind of a lot of that coming out right now? I think that there is there is definitely a place for it now. I Like I, I was talking about last week, uh, movies like The Purge and You're Next – Sure. Uh, I, I mean, it's weird because horror movies tend to come out in the summer mm -hmm. uh, and then Halloween comes around and then we're back to our ghosts and ghoulies again. Sure, sure. But I think that, I don't know, we've said this on the show a lot. I think that the biggest thing that you can do to scare me in a film is show that people can be horrible. <laughs> sure, sure. A um, reminder of something that is definitely true, but not a widespread enough to remember in our daily lives. Maybe. So when you get something like The Loved Ones, which it bases itself on a scenario that I would say one out of every two people in the entire world comes up with, having to let someone down sure, who's sure. interested in you romantically. Yeah, right. I mean, if not 50%, 100%, you know. <laughs> right, we're getting this back is, to the relatability here. This is an everyday occurrence. Not an every, it is an everyday occurrence, not for an individual. 
but right. for the human race. Every nine minutes, someone you love will yeah. get rejected at a dance somewhere. And, and it's one of those things that it's one of those few things that I think the human race is not really ever okay. It's one of those things where you go, well, you got to do it, man. You got to do it. <laughs> right. I mean, it's the right thing to do. You either let them down now or you let them down later when it's more painful. Sure. But when people say, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, they kidnap you and they... <laughs> Right. You know, <laughs> right, nail your foot right. to the floor. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, the foot to the floor is pretty bad. The um, the urinate in the cup uh, yeah. hammer is the fucking worst. It's one of the things scary. I love about the movie is that, one, I don't think there's a shred of nudity in the film no. for a film that is so much about teenage sex and romance and mutilation of genitals. Mm -hmm. uh, so to make me think I just watched a really sadistic movie, uh, again, along the lines of something like Inside, and then think back and go, well, yeah, it was bloody, but there wasn't as much genital mutilation. Sure. That's really the bar for these types of Well, of but movies. what it lacks in genital mutilation, it makes <laughs> up for in, in burgeoning incestuous love. Sure. You know right. what I mean? Well, yeah, it's it's still pushing some boundaries. I mean, this is, after all, it feels like a splat pack film. It definitely it does. It sits uh, beautifully on Australia's shelf right next to Wolf oh, Creek. right, yeah. Which so happy that that's becoming an industry. Mm -hmm. And the way it manages to do it in completely different ways, in different ways from a lot of these splat pack type movies, while still giving you the feeling that it did those things. Mm -hmm. Replace nudity with incest. Sure. You know, still have these uh these torture scenes, but have them God, I mean <laughs> the the amount of tension or anxiety I get from this escape that happens in the beginning. Yeah. I don't get that a lot in our textbook escape scenes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he breaks free after this ten seconds to urinate thing, which already just was pretty fucked up. But he breaks free, runs out of the house, and in that scene of running out of the house and the car chase and running up the tree, I mean, my fucking heart is going. Sure. It's really, yeah. I mean, it's having the impact it is going for. Well, and we get, we get this other interesting thing that we never see in horror movies, especially on Double Feature, where the final girl is a guy. Yeah, sure. Um, I could think back to a couple we've done, and they've all been great. Yeah. And uh, we also get this weird thing where his continuous attempts to escape are foiled because the odds are so far stacked against him. Sure. The thing that I think people tend to fall prey to in these survival horror type movies mm -hmm. is in a scenario where it's a woman, we tend to give that, well, she got away, but I mean, it's a dude. He can just you know punch her or something. <laughs> sure and she's out for the count well that's the other thing is uh in this movie not only is our final girl a uh, boy but also the killer uh, the the primary killer i sure. guess is a woman yeah and we you know we don't see that very often either mm -hmm. especially in this this one-on-one -on -one kind of right i'm thinking again back to hostile again back to there's really just one person we're not so much picking off people one by one right we're just going to capture a guy in the beginning of the movie torture him for an hour and 10 minutes and then have some kind of resolution at the end right and there's this weird inflammatory moment and i don't know if you saw this for me but you have this girl and her father and he's hovering behind her the whole time with this role as the enabler you know he's gripping the hammer he's do what she says or i'm going to fucking beat your nuts off right right and so for me when he breaks free that second time and he goes for the father and he stabs him in the throat again it, it it's probably this this idea that horror movies have given me that men can overpower women in a violent scenario. Sure, that she should lose her power. Right. The enforcer's it's gone. what we've seen. Mm -hmm. And instead of this, she, he kills the father, 
And suddenly she's like, okay, well now all bets are off. Yeah. She's supercharged. (laughs) You've killed my dad and now there's nobody holding me back. Right. Yeah. Because I don't have anything to live for now. So you go live with my cannibal ex-boyfriends while I slaughter your family. (laughs) And that's how we're going to play the next 20 minutes of the film. (laughs) Yeah. And that's just the violence. I mean, the other two things I like a lot about the loved ones are, um, you know, to get back to that incestuous moment and the wondering what the woman at the table, what her deal is. Sure. Uh, you get the family around the table, kind of Texas Chainsaw vibe. Mm-hmm. And once you sort of figure out what's going on with her, you at least become comfortable with her. We open the box, we open the basement, mm-hmm. and we get the what the fuck yeah. kind of sounds going on down there. So there is the the constant unraveling of what this story is Uh but then the other thing is uh, and i i don't mean this in a way that detracts from the film at all but it's kind of lighthearted. yeah it's kind of comedic and it's kind of um i think if anything it gets even lighter at the end they make a couple extra jokes agreed it's the salting the chest wound and the trembling mess of pain that's really kind of the heavy part just glitter and pain the thing so maybe not i don't know the thing for me was the handling of the Dahmer zombie part so the whole thing where they were drilling the hole in the skull um and then pouring the boiling water to cook the brain that scene doesn't usually happen we don't actually see the drill go in right. very often we just usually flirt with the idea and sure then the cable comes unplugged right Well, so that's, and here's, here's a little bit of my, my dark knowledge coming out, but (laughs) that's based on, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a serial killer out of Ohio, um, who was, uh, he gets accused and you'll hear this a lot. And it's bizarre because it's true of, uh, having an army of gay zombies in his basement. (laughs) Uh, uh, what he used to drill whole he he was he was i mean you know he he's dead so there's really no definitive evidence but he was probably gay and he used to meet guys at gay bars this is back in the 70s when that's you know a little bit less okay in the public standing <laughs> sure, and yeah. uh when the entire earth was less progressive right um, I don't know that there were necessarily less men meeting in gay bars. Right, in the no, 70s, but though. you know there were fewer sure, states I take your point. with with legalized gay marriage. My eyebrows are far more raised <laughs> than the other thing you're saying. So I'm. He I'm, used to drill holes in these guys' heads and then pour battery acid. Really, in, in an effort to subdue them to do his bidding. Why have I never heard about? And he this? was eventually discovered because one of them got away. So imagine you're walking down the street in Ohio and some naked gay guy with a hole in his head comes running up to you. Sure. And starts screaming all this, you know, horrifying nonsense. So now the thing for me is when they're drilling holes in this guy's head and they're going to pour the boiling water in, I'm freaking the fuck out because I know this (laughs) this shit has happened. Sure, sure. And part of me is trying to be the pragmatic science fellow who goes, whatever, if you pour boiling water in the skull, the brain won't feel it. Right. <laughs> and the other, the, the other part of me is going, don't cook his fucking brain. That's weird. Don't cook his fucking brain. That's weird. Wow. I didn't know any of this. I'm uh, highly skeptical, but it would be more than you let on on the show. You know a lot about serial killers that yeah. uh, for whatever reason doesn't come up as, as often as you think it would. I'm going to have to look into this. This is really yeah, interesting to me. It's really bizarre. And so that aspect of the movie to me, again, to juxtapose it against the lighthearted, wait, wait, did I, you need to make the whole bigger daddy. Yeah, sure. To, to juxtapose something that in my mind is a reality. Right. And to goof <laughs> off with that. Yeah. That's like somebody using a toy airplane and pretending to fly it into the Twin Towers. Sure. You know, like yeah. it, it becomes a lot darker by making it funny. Were you shouting too soon at your uh, television I set? I don't believe in too soon. So I do. Um, that's the other great part is right in the beginning, the guy running out into the, you know, into the road. Yeah. The Dahmer zombie, I guess, yeah. running out into the road. And you expecting that that's kind of the moment where he then death curses them or haunts them or becomes Stephen King's thinner or something. (laughs) And, uh, and later you just know, you just kind of find out that was one of the guys that's, uh, it reminds me of the two kids in the car. 
it's just a B story. We see it and we go, well, these things must connect because that's what horror movies do. Yeah. And then we learn that we probably spent a lot more time uh, with awkward makeout scenes at the, you know, the school dance right. than we really needed to, to inform the story. Yeah. Part of the beauty of the loved ones is uh, we're just going to hang out over here for a while. That's just something we're doing. And uh, then we'll go back to this. I also like where the movie ends a lot. I like that, um, you know, go home, even with the hole. Once the hole gets drilled in the head, I'm thinking, well, this is it. It's all over. But no, it kind of makes it out. Mm -hmm. it goes home, hugs mom, short movie, no time for nonsense. That's where we end. Double feature show at gmail.com if you know about the Sean Bryan, Rhonda Bryan thing. Uh, and doublefeatureshow.com is the site for the, uh, the podcast. What are we doing next time? Oh, man, that's a really good question, because even after I answer it, the question is still going to stand. Next time, we're going to do a Todd Salon's John Waters double feature. Oh, hell yeah. Um, that would be palindrones and female trouble. In an overarching female trouble themed double feature. So awesome. Watch more fucking film. Bye.